everyone. I'm Ian McCarthy of Lifting for Life, and today I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes about the study recently published on the topic of pre- versus post-workout protein supplementation. And this is a study authored by Brad Schoenfeld, James Krieger, Alan Aragon, and colleagues. And we're very fortunate in this case in that the full text of the study is freely available. So I would encourage you to read that. I will put a link to it in the description box below this video. And if you're someone who doesn't enjoy reading scientific literature, which I can completely understand, each to their own, I would encourage you to not just read the abstract, rather read the methods section and read the results section. So you know what they did and you know what the results were, and you'll save time in not reading the introduction and the discussion, but you will see a lot that you would miss in just reading the abstract. So. This study was designed to test the, legit the, the legitimacy, excuse me, I can't speak English, of the anabolic window theory. Now, there are a number of variations of this, but broadly speaking, the idea is that after you perform resistance training, there is an anabolic window of an hour or less in which consuming protein will be disproportionately beneficial relative to consuming it at any other time of day. In other words, you consume 20 grams of protein, you're going to gain more muscle if you consume it then versus before training or eight hours later or earlier in the day. So I think the authors deserve a lot of credit in that their methodology was highly intuitive. Sometimes in reading the scientific literature, you'll see things that might actually make sense. Like there might be really good justification for what was done, but when you first look at it, you're like, why is it that they used six grams of essential amino acids? Like, why was that the thing instead of perhaps whole protein? Or why six grams? Why not more or less than that? So in this case, again, the methodology is very straightforward. They took a group of college-age males, 21 people ultimately finished the study, and they split them into two groups. Both groups did the same training, three days a week full body training for 10 weeks, one group consumed a whey protein shake immediately prior to training, and they were instructed to not consume anything for three hours after training. And the other group was given the same protein shake immediately after training, and they were instructed to not consume anything three hours prior to training. And the objective was for everything else to be the same. The only difference between these groups is the timing of that identical protein shake. So I do think this is a good way of approaching this. And in wanting to give a balanced perspective, because I am going to critique not really the study so much as some conclusions that I've seen drawn from it, I want to speak to strengths of this study. One is it's a training study. It's an applied study. In other words, it isn't mechanistic, which is to say it isn't a study which had subjects some subjects consume protein and then train, and then maybe they look at muscle protein synthesis, like actually in the muscle, as opposed to looking at muscle gain over time. And then in another group, they have them train, they give them a protein shake, they also look at muscle protein synthesis. Because there are a great number of studies like that, I think they're valuable. But in doing research like that, I was going to say in doing research like that, we, I am not a researcher, but when research like that is done, the question has to, has to be asked, what does this tell us about muscle gain in the real world? We can't simply assume that if one protocol elevates muscle protein synthesis more, then that's definitely going to yield greater muscle gain over time. So in the case of this study, they actually looked at lean body mass. They actually looked at muscle thickness over time. So that drastically, in my opinion, strengthens this study in terms of potential for strong practical implications. So I think that's great. Additionally, the ways in which they measured things like lean body mass and muscle thickness were about as good as they're going to get. They used DEXA for body mass, like evaluating lean body mass, fat mass, etc. And they used ultrasound for muscle thickness which is very, very close to the gold standard of MRI. So this is tremendously better than, say, th there's some research in which lean body mass or muscle size was approximated through literally measuring arm circumference 
which is tremendously less accurate than, excuse me, tremendously less accurate than the methods that they used in this case. So again, these are two huge strengths of this study. And the result was that there was not a statistically significant difference in any of the measured outcomes, lean body mass, muscle thickness, uh, maximal strength between groups. So the conclusion I've seen drawn from this on social media more or less universally is, okay, there isn't an anabolic window, or if there is one, it's a lot longer than you know immediately after training. If you consume protein before training, immediately prior to training, you shouldn't worry about consuming protein immediately afterwards. And I will grant that the study did in fact not show statistically significant differences between these two approaches. But statistical significance is, has to do with whether or not a certain result is attributable to chance or the actual differences between groups, different interventions. So and I think if we dig into the limitations of this study, which I'm going to do now, we can see that this doesn't falsify a more nuanced version of the anabolic window theory. So for one thing, the sample size was fairly small. 58 subjects initially, 21 subjects by the end of the study, which to be clear really isn't bad for a study like this. You typically see fairly small sample sizes, but what that does mean is it's more difficult to tease out small differences between groups. And this becomes more of an issue given all of the characteristics of the study because another major issue which the authors directly and credit to them for addressing this, the subjects were instructed to be in a daily energy surplus, daily calorie surplus of 500 calories a day, which is very significant. That's a ton of food. And the objective in doing that was to create an environment in which uh, the hypertrophic response, muscle gain, would be maximized. And then in maximizing that in both groups, the hope would be that they would have a significant effect, and then they could compare that between groups and say, you know, this group gained, just making these numbers up, but 35% muscle thickness here, this group 25%. So these are big gains, but there's also a big difference in gains. So making the effect size like the actual size of the effect larger in both groups, makes it easier to discern a difference between them. Now, the diet was not controlled. The subjects were told what to do. They were given a diet containing 1.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day, fat intake on a percentage basis of total daily energy intake, and then the remainder from carbs. But given the food logs that the subjects actually kept and which were evaluated, it turns out that they ultimately were in an energy deficit, and that's confirmed by the fact that they lost fat throughout the study. So the explanation proposed by the authors, I'm not sure if this was in the study or on Facebook, but perhaps the subjects thought, okay, we're, do we're part of a controlled scientific study. Hey, this is a good opportunity to get leaner. So what that means, if we look at the results, is that Neither of these groups actually made good gains. Now I realize good, you know, how are you going to define that? But if you look at the effect sizes for muscle thickness specifically, which I think is the main thing we should care about if we're going to talk about hypertrophy because it's the most direct measure of what we care about. The, and I'm just going from memory here. I've read this study twice, but just off the top of my head now, there were one group, the post group, made moderately good, like the effect size was moderate for biceps thickness only. Everything else had a small effect size, if not a negative effect size. So some of these groups actually, I'm trying to think of how to put this. If we look at some measures of muscle thickness, because they looked at multiple muscles in different locations, they actually lost size. I think vastus lateralis was an example in one or both groups. So on average, the size of the vastus lateralis of these subjects actually went down throughout the study. So what this means is that if we're trying to discern a, a 
whether or not there is an advantage, a small but maybe in the long term advantage to consuming protein post-workout versus pre, but what we actually see is that subjects are losing muscle thickness, then I would contend that this does not actually falsify the anabolic window theory in the sense of there being a, that small advantage which accumulates over time, as opposed to a very large advantage which would show itself in a shorter study like this. And this brings me to, excuse me, another limitation, which is the length of the study itself. It is a 10-week study, which is actually going back to the sample size issue. That's good, that's good for a study like this. And indeed, you can see a number of studies I'm thinking Schoenfeld 2014, the quote, quote, bodybuilding versus powerlifting study, Schoenfeld 2015, which was the one versus three day a week frequency study. And I'm just going from memory, those were either eight or 10 week studies. And you can see differences that significant differences in strength gains and muscle gains in studies of this length. But I think that if there is a difference, between if there is an, an advantage to consuming protein immediately after training versus pre in terms of long-term muscle gain, that advantage will be less than the advantage of training a muscle three times more often. In other words, a study of this length might not be long enough to, again, falsify that more nuanced version of the anabolic window theory. So in short, again, I would agree with, with the conclusions of the study and what's been said on social media in terms of this shows that there most likely isn't a very robust, consistent advantage to consuming protein immediately post-workout as opposed to immediately pre. But I don't think it falsifies the claim or the view or the contention that there's a slight advantage which over a period of perhaps 10 months or 10 years, which is actually something we care about if we're talking about long-term hypertrophy through a bodybuilder's whole career or through a lifetime of resistance training, which, which might actually be there. So who's to say if there will ever be a study which will be so powered that it will really be able to speak to that? And I wouldn't on the basis of this study say, hey, there is an advantage. So you should definitely be consuming your, your protein post-workout. But I find myself, and I don't have any desire to criticize the authors or to say that this study was a waste of time because I see comments like that a lot regarding studies like this, like, hey, didn't we already know this? Well, it doesn't even show you anything, so why was it done? But I don't find it changing my feelings about what we should be doing in practice uh, given these limitations I've discussed. So thank you so much for watching, guys. I appreciate your time. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. If you like, I guess this is a research summary or research review video. Uh, if, you, if you'd like for me to put out more videos like this, please do make sure to like this. That will indicate to me that you liked it. And we will see you again soon. Thank you guys so much.